All righty. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's social media feeds this morning. We are live right now for Science Friday's Cephalopod Week 2021. Make sure that you are hashtagging Cephalopod Week wherever you are. Make sure you're heading over to the Ambari, uh, to Ambari's websites and also to the aquarium's websites to find your very own Zoom Cephalopod-themed backgrounds and other uh, fun things for all of y'all if you're wondering who is talking to you? My name is Patrick. I'm under all the logos right over here on the upper right right of your screen. Yeah, there we go. Upper right of the screen for everybody. Uh, if anything breaks during this broadcast, that would be my fault. So uh, right over here. If you could just let everybody in the chat know that you can hear us, that we're coming through live, loud and clear, uh, let us know. Otherwise, we'll do some... Uh, some troubleshooting there, um, but we're very, very excited to have with us an esteemed panel of guests to talk all about cephalopods, our uh, our mollusk friends there that have their own very special week. We don't have snail week quite yet, but cephalopod week, certainly uh, always a fun tradition. Just to introduce to you who we've got here on the screen, directly below me over here, we've got Susan Von Toon, George Matsumoto over here, and then we've got uh, Cassie, I don't know why I'm blanking on your name right now, Cassie, but Cassie's down there on the on the bottom there. Um, and uh, they are part of the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute or Embari's uh, social media feeds and uh, science communication channels. So if you're in the chats on their accounts, uh, you are getting your questions answered directly by uh, these fast fingers over here. Um, all the way on the opposite side of the screen from me, we've got the better half of the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team and Emily. There's Emily over there. Uh, and Emily will be monitoring the the chat for questions uh, during this live stream. Emily, how you doing uh, over there? Doing good? Yeah, doing incredible, Pat. Incredible. That's right here for Cephalopod Week. And then uh, to my uh, uh, to the left over here on your screen next to me, we have uh, our amazing cephalopod scientists that will be telling us all about their research and the cool things going on there in the ocean. So directly next to me, we've got uh, Ben Burford here and then Chrissy Hufford. And look at that squid shirt. Yes. Rocking the squid shirt. We've got baby squids behind Chrissy uh, and Ben. Um, just very quickly, uh, Chrissy, Ben, welcome to the live stream. Uh, maybe starting with you, Chrissy, can you uh, introduce us a little bit to you and uh, and your work? What will we be talking about today? Hey, so I'm Chrissy Hufford. I have a background in cephalopod behavior and biology, and I love studying cephalopods in their natural habitat following them around in the water, understanding how they find food, mates, defend themselves from predators, and really survive to make it to the next generation. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, Chrissy. And then Ben, uh, can you tell us what you've got going on? Sweet. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I just finished my PhD in cephalopod behavior and ecology. So the information is still fresh, hopefully. And uh, now I've moved on to study salmon, but I'm always trying to, to get back with cephalopods. So it's awesome to be here. And uh, I especially love how they communicate with each other, but I'm also into every facet of their lives. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for that, Ben. Um, for whatever reason, it seems like Zoom has decided to change up its UI once again. So apologies for the, the rough transitions there uh, between the spotlights. But before we get started, before we launch into all of your questions, we just want to do what we always do, which is introduce the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute to all of you out there. Um, I'm sure the folks on the Embari social media channels know, but if anyone's watching on the aquariums or tuning in uh, for the first time, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is located about 20 miles north of the bay. Oh, Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> I started off real strong on uh, my intro and then uh, it appears that my HDMI connection is throwing up a red screen of doom there. Well, that's fun. Oh no. Hey Emily, while I fix that uh, yeah. real quick, do you want to, oh goodness. Oh, let's see. Okay. You, hey Emily, do you, you want to go to a Otherwise, question real I have, quick? Yeah, I have <laughs> questions already. Um, in fact, awesome. I think that this is, this is going to be a, uh, a nice easy one to kind of introduce what we're doing right now. Uh, Chrissy and Ben, 
could you tell us what is a cephalopod? We are celebrating cephalopod week right now. Uh, we have some people tuning in who might not be familiar with that word. So what is a cephalopod? Chrissy, can I just start by saying head foot? Yeah. Yes. Head foot. There we go. Go for it, Ben. Head foot. That's what cephalopods are. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nailed it. Succinct. Moving on. All right. Next. Well, you know, I, 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 can, I can elaborate a touch. I would, my favorite flavor of the cephalopod is the squid, but there's a few different flavors. There's squids, octopuses, cuttlefish, and nautiluses. And they're all related to your garden snail. They're all mollusks, but they're kind of this midwater. They're this mollusk that can swim around in the ocean, in the ocean's midwaters. So I always tell people when you think of like cephalopod, especially squid, stuff like that, think of like the snail's equivalent of a fish. That's what I always say. But you know, that's a little bit deeper. What do you got to say, uh, Chrissy? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. And acknowledging that a lot of cephalopods do live in the midwater, but there are also ones that live close to the seafloor or on the seafloor. Octopuses live on the seafloor and crawl around. And cuttlefishes, sometimes they crawl on the seafloor and sometimes they hover and spend most of their time just within a couple of meters of the seafloor. Yeah, you're talking about animals without a backbone. Um, they have two eyes like we do. Usually they have fins, though not always. Some of them uh, push themselves around with jet propulsion as well. But these are animals that usually can move themselves. Um, some of them have an external shell, but most do not. And uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of soft, sort of squishy, but some are more muscular than others. Yeah. And Alex. Oh, Chrissy, go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. Oh, no, I was just going to say, Patrick, I see you smiling at the screen. Is everything okay? Or do you? Well, who knows? Uh, but we'll give it a shot if anyone wants to hear a quick little <laughs> intro about Mbari. Uh, once again, I, I can um, I can certainly <laughs> certainly try that out there. Emily, look, I've got a side by side. Okay, let me try this one Aww. one more time. All right. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, you're looking at it right here, is located about 20 miles north of the aquarium uh, near Moss Landing and near Elkhorn Slough. You folks may have heard of Elkhorn Slough. That's where we tend to release our rescued sea otter pups. Here is the Rachel Carson, one of the... Um, one of the research vessels that Mbari uh, has aboard the Rachel Carson are a lot of different uh, scientific instruments, including ROVs or remotely operated vehicles. This one right here is called the Ventana, literally our window into the deep sea. And that's how we're going to be looking at a lot of the deep sea footage today of cephalopods. Uh, and aboard those ROVs are cameras and scientific instruments that allow scientists to spend hours on end in the deep sea in the crushing depths there uh, without having to send down endless scuba tanks for everybody hanging out uh, forever down there. Uh, back aboard the ships, you've got the scientists in the control room taking a look at all of the various video footage there. And so that is how we're going to be uh, showing you some of those videos there of um, of organisms in the deep sea. But if I can nail this transition, I can show you. No, I did not nail that transition. Hold on. <laughs> um, where's my where's my canyon video? All right, let's try this canyon video. There we go. Nicely done. This is a brand new animation that uh, Mbari came out with recently. You can see there's Mbari, uh, the Monterey Peninsula there to the south. And looking out over this uh, bay, if you were to drain the ocean, you would see that we effectively have the Grand Canyon out here underwater. The Monterey Submarine Canyon is two miles deep of ocean at its deepest point, and it's a mile deep from the rim of the canyon down to the bottom. So imagine you take the Grand Canyon that we all know and love, and you put another mile of water there on top of it. And in these depths, you have lots of different cool critters on the seafloor, on the walls, in the midwater, all the way to the surface. And so we'll be talking about um, various animals that we find in this canyon, along the slopes of the canyon, but we're also going to be talking about the shallow water stuff. So cephalopods, uh, the cephalopods that you may find on a snorkel on a dive for yourself here locally. So um, in case you were wondering uh, why we are out there looking at all of that deep sea uh, loveliness, um, it is because of our access there to that, uh, that submarine canyon here. Now if I can just figure out what is going on with these videos. Okay, 
nicely done. So that intro was totally worth it. I'm so glad y'all stuck around to do it. But um, with that, um, I'd like to maybe kick it over to, to Chrissy uh, real quick. If you just want to tell us a little bit about um, about your work with the shallow water cephalopods, and then we'll continue on uh, with Ben down, uh, down into the deeps a little bit later. Sure. So a lot of people think about cephalopods, um, you know, when many people think about cephalopods, they think about these animals that can change color really quickly. And that's probably the most famous trait that cephalopods have. And I, you know, people ask, how do they do it? Um, what What's behind all of that? And what good is that for, for them in the wild? And so I have behind me a picture of a baby hatchling blue ringed octopus. This is from video that was taken by Roy Caldwell, my major professor at UC Berkeley. And if you look behind me, I'll try to get out of the way here. <laughs> um, there are the little tiny dots on the top of, let's see, I, I can't really point because my finger moves away. <laughs> but if you go up, there we go. These tiny dots here, those are chromatophores. They're little sacs of pigment inside of the octopus's skin. Cuttlefish and squid have them too. Um, and they have muscles around them that can allow them to expand and contract. And if we can see the little chromatophores on the top are um, small because the muscles attached to them haven't pulled them open. If we look at the ones toward the bottom, the muscles have pulled them open and we can see the color that's in that little pigment sac in the skin. And as cephalopods mature, they their skin develops further and they get more and more complex skin patterns, but the underlying mechanism behind that is these chromatophores. And the location of the chromatophores on the skin is fixed. They, the, they can't move their chromatophores from one part of the skin to the other. And um, the colors that are in them are also fixed. So a chromatophore um, might develop a little bit of color change within its um, development over time as it ages, but a green chromatophore isn't going to become a pink chromatophore in its lifetime. And so that okay. sort of sets some constraints on how cephalopods can change colors. And um, as cephalopods have evolved, you know, um, one fun fact about them is that they don't have, um, they don't see many colors. Really, they see, you know, one color. And so we look at a scene like this, um, there is an octopus in the middle of this frame. And... <laughs> That's an animal in Hawaii, and it has an amazing ability to match its color and texture of its background. And um, this animal um, is not described by science. It doesn't have a scientific name, um, but there are lots of, and there are lots of cephalopods in this world that don't have a scientific name, but we can tell that they're different from the other ones out there based on their bodies um, form, but also by what they look like in life. And there are lots of octopuses actually in Hawaii that maybe they haven't necessarily had a lot of scientific research, but there's a rich cultural understanding of the octopuses and other cephalopods in Hawaii and throughout the world. And um, it's a great chance for people all, of the, all over the world with lots of different cultural understanding of how animals behave and look um, in the wild to really contribute to scientific understanding by sharing you know, their, their pictures and video of cephalopods in the wild to really help all sorts of people understand what they look like in different habitats. And so, um, Patrick, I don't know, you know, when yeah. we think about cephalopods and color change, do you have any pictures or images of a flamboyant cuttlefish? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I can bring I can bring one of those up real quick. That would be great. Okay. And so, um, you know, cephalopods have this ability to change color. Um, for animals that live close to the bottom, they're able to match their background. They're, even though they don't see color, their predators 
can see color. And so the predators have evolved this, um, you know, taken part in this natural selection process, eaten the ones that aren't good matches and the ones that are good matches to their background and have great camouflage, um, survive and reproduce. But every once in a while, we see a cephalopod that has some really zany looking colors. And the flamboyant cuttlefish is an example of that. I'm uh, working on getting you one that has okay. the appropriate coloration right now because uh, the newer photo that I have has a purplish tint from some fun lighting that was used. But uh, <laughs> yeah, keep going, keep going, almost okay. there. Okay, okay. And so, you know, there are cephalopods that have really um, high contrast colors. And are they warning colors? Um, do they serve some other purpose? And it's really important... Um, to if you know we can study them in aquaria and we can get an amazing sense of what they look like in aquaria but it's also really important to look at them in the wild to sort of test these ideas of of what color change or different camouflage abilities might do for these animals in the wild and i'm um, almost there <laughs> okay <laughs> sounds good um and so Here's a little interesting thing about the flamboyant cuttlefish that we're about to see. They might be venomous um, and potentially also poisonous. Venomous is when an animal is toxic. Um, you get a toxin from the bite. Poisonous is if it's toxic to eat. And so it's possible that these are these fantastic color patterns that we're looking at are part of that warning colors coloration. Um, but I'm also going to show some video behind me um, that gives a sense of what these animals look like in the wild. So I'll get out of the way here. What we're looking at here is a video from Indonesia of flamboyant cuttlefishes in their natural habitat, flamboyant cuttlefish in their natural habitat. We can see the really big one on the right is actually very well camouflaged. And the small ones on the left are also, you know, they're showing their color patterns, but they're also, you know, kind of blending into the background as well. And so even though this color pattern is pretty incredible to look at, it's also serving as a little bit of camouflage considering how complex their natural habitat actually is. Awesome. Um, we yes. actually have a, kind of a great question, two questions that came in uh, r related to the flamboyant cuttlefishes. Mm -hmm. um, folks are curious if they can't see colors, how do they know how to match the background? And another person, very perceptive, picked up on this. Any thoughts on how polarized light uh, helps in cephalopod communications? Yeah, so those are great questions that come up a lot. Um, how do they actually match their background? And I'll be totally honest with you, there's still a ton of mystery left. And so if you're thinking about going into science and going into cephalopod biology as, a, as something you might want to study, um, just know that this is there are lots of unanswered questions related to this. Um, we know that they do take in information about the sort of size of things in around them to help them guide their color change. Um, we know that they are able to have a, they have really good sense of contrast. And so that um, allows them to um, match their background pretty well. It's also possible and it's been, been hypothesized, but not truly proven yet um, uh, that the shape of their pupils actually might help them maybe not see color the way we see color, but differentiate um, differentiate different wavelengths of light. And so I'm showing a cuttlefish behind me. You can see that its pupil is shaped almost like a W um, or a U-shaped um, pupil. And that might help them cut down on glare. It might also help them um, different, differentiate something kind of like colors um, that's kind of debatable but there's a you know there are a lot of questions that can be tested there are a lot of different ways to look at that that hopefully people will work out in the future 
octopuses don't quite have that shape of pupil. Their pupil is more rectangular, almost like a slit, but it's possible it might do something similar. But really cephalopods can't quite see colors the way that we can. Um, this octopus can't necessarily tell the difference between blue and orange, they're opposite colors, if those colors have the same brightness and contrast. And they, it really does seem like, although they have some capabilities to control their camouflage, that the fact that their predators can see color has been involved in their natural selection. The question about polarized light was a great one. They can see polarized light. We can't do that. Our eyes don't have that built-in functionality. But many of us add that to our own vision by wearing polarized sunglasses. For example, I wear polarized sunglasses when I go to the ocean because it helps me cut through the glare of the surface of the water and see a little better into the water. And cephalopods have that built into their eyes. And that seems to help them in some cases catch prey more easily, um, might cut down on the glare of their shiny fish prey, for example. Um, it's been, you know, people wonder, can they use this for communication? Because they can see, they have polarized body patterns. We can't see, but they can see. But so far, um, it, people haven't cracked that code to understand how or even whether that's really an important part of their communication. Um, but there, there's plenty of research that hasn't been explored. Lots of questions remain. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing uh, all of that there, Chrissy. Let me bring back the rest of the panel uh, real quick. So um, thank you, everybody who's been tuning in. I see a, a few new faces out there. If you haven't uh, figured out what we're doing here yet, uh, this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute here for a very special cephalopod week live stream here. We've been chatting with Chrissy uh, about some uh, cephalopods. We've been answering your questions. And then coming up next, we got some more um, things related to the deep sea. But thank you so much for tuning in. Emily, uh, what are some of the questions we, we might have here just off of what Chrissy might be talking about? And then we're going to we're going to dive down a little bit deeper because cephalopods used to rule the oceans uh, back in the day. Um, and uh, and so they've they've they're everywhere. So we've been talking about shallow. We're going to go a little bit deeper. But in between, Emily, what do the folks want? know yeah we've had a lot of great questions coming in uh i'm going to start with one that uh actually has to do with something that we were talking about before we even went live patrick about uh cephalopod lifespans uh so folks are curious they've heard that octopuses typically have fairly short lifespans uh what about the rest of our cephalopod friends yeah chrissy you want to take that one real quick then we'll go over okay. to ben okay um a lot of cephalopod lifespan um, is correlates with the water temperature in which they live. And so a lot of shallow water cephalopods live in fairly warm waters and, um, you know, but even shallow water cephalopods that live in cold waters, you know, their lifespans are pretty long. Um, a lot of the coverage about cephalopod lifespan talks about the end of the life um, being this time when the female lays her eggs and she sort of sacrifices herself for those eggs. But um, it's actually the case that even when a female lays eggs, even if those eggs are infertile or if something prevents her from laying eggs, um, her lifespan is kind of predetermined. It's, it's already going to be short. So it's not that the laying eggs um, leads to her dying. It's she's laying eggs at what would naturally be the end of her lifespan anyway. And the same is the case for males. The males kind of die at the end of that lifespan anyway, and that happens to be a fairly short lifespan. Most cephalopods, octopuses, cuttlefishes, squids, um, uh, actually reproduce in sort of one round of maturing eggs and sperm, and they reproduce toward the end of their lifespan and release all of their eggs, lay all the eggs kind of in one round. Um, but there are some that lay their eggs in little batches toward the end of their lifespan and might be able to expand that period of egg laying, might be able to prolong that a bit. But for the most part, most cephalopods have a short lifespan that includes one major round of reproduction. And 
Kirstie, since we were talking about uh, kind of the changes in color patterns and chromatophores, uh, we had another great question come in uh, over on Twitch. Are cephalopods able to mimic patterns not found in nature? For example, if you were to put them in like on top of a, a checkerboard, would they be able to mimic that? Yeah, the, that's a great question. The degree, the short answer is yes, if their skin anatomy allows it. And so they are, if they're put onto something like a background with small dots, they'll have on their skin, um, and this is species dependent, not every species can do this, but the species that have great color change abilities would have produce small little patches of um, color, um, maybe dark spots on their body and patches and, and sort of clumps of, of you know, the, that pattern. If you put them on a larger, um, like a checkerboard, a larger checkerboard, they would make larger patterns on their body. Um, it would, at some point, they're bound by their own anatomy, like they might not be able to get the exact square of the checkerboard, but they would get like the gist of the checkerboard. They would get the the impression of the checkerboard by kind of reproducing the size of the checkers and the spacing of the different colors uh, on that checkerboard, even if they don't get the colors themse themselves right. They might be able to produce a black and white checkerboard pretty well, but not necessarily like a a purple and orange one if they don't have purple and orange chromatophores. And there's some pretty good work on cuttlefishes doing this. Awesome. Well, cool. Uh, well, thank you so much, Emily, for those questions there from the audience. Keep sending those along. We've got, uh, again, Susan and George and Cassie here that are out there um, uh, answering your questions there. But uh, I wanted to uh, dive in a little bit deeper, <laughs> as it were, and go with uh, and talk to Ben a little bit um, because these are some of the things that the shallow water cephalopods are doing there. Chrissy was, was talking about. There's a lot of color variation and, and things there, communication going on also between those individuals. And then down in the deep sea where there's maybe less light, you might think, oh, maybe the cephalopods aren't really doing much in terms of changing color or, or anything like that. Um, but it turns out that uh, cephalopods are communicating a vast, a wide, uh, a, across a wide array of, uh, of communication styles in the deep. So maybe I'll kick it over to Ben as a transition to go into the, the deeper water. Um, tell us what's going on with deep sea cephalopods. How are they communicating with each other with less light around them? Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll uh, just start by pointing to the, the squid behind me right now. So this is the California market squid. Um, and this is a species that I think is pretty emblematic of this, of the type of cephalopod that sort of treads the transition between shallow and deep water. So Chrissy was just talking to us about, you know, reef living animals, shallow living cephalopods. Um, and this is a good intermediate species because this is a species that really the main thing that ties it to near shore shallow areas is the end of its life that we were just talking about when they reproduce and lay eggs. So this species and many others that are related to it, um, they have to lay their eggs on a benthic substrate. And they can't lay them too deep because the eggs will be in too cold a water to develop properly. So they're after like pretty shallow water. But aside from that, this species will spend most of its life, um, you know, usually away from the coast in, in this giant habitat that we would call the midwater. And so the, the open ocean or the, or the midwater is, this, is the largest inhabitable space on the planet. It's over 95% of the biosphere. And it's, it's a habitat that's really hard to, to conceive and to like picture ourselves in because it's just so different from what you and I are experiencing right now. Right now I'm sitting in a chair, there's lots of light, I'm looking outside. Well, the midwater of the ocean, the open ocean, it's a habitat without walls. It's typically dark, dimly lit. And that is the habitat that this species primarily inhabits and a lot of other squids as well. So squids are a type of cephalopod. Um, you can see on this, on this squid, it has the chromatophores, just like Chrissy was pointing to, and I believe it was an, a little baby octopus. You can see all these little dots um, all over the animal. Those are those chromatophores as well, the things that 
cephalopods can use to change their pigmentation patterning or their color. Um, now, the fact that this animal has them is a pretty big clue that, you know, it needs to be able to change color as well, or its pigmentation patterning, just like the deeper living species as well. Um, now, this is a species that will typically come into well-lit waters, at least at some point in its life. So it's perhaps not too surprising that it has these patterns as well. Now, there are many other kinds of squids that perpetually inhabit the open ocean. And what I mean by that is they are born in the open ocean, they live in the open ocean, and they die in the open ocean. They live their whole lives without coming into contact with the hard surface. And what they typically do in that habitat is they live under perpetually low light levels. So they will live down deep in the ocean during the day, usually. There's, they do this process called daily vertical migration, where when the sun rises, they dive down deep into the ocean. And then when the sun sets, they tend to come up shallower. And there's many reasons that they think they do this. Largely, we think it's you know, to hide from predators and to find food. That kind of dictates their vertical movements. Now, um, I'll just go ahead and show some video of a, of a squid in the deep also just behind me. And what you'll be able to see in this, uh, in this case, this is a Humboldt squid. I should get out of the way. It's probably right behind me at the moment, but it's a Humboldt squid. And this is an animal that, so you can see this, this animal's fins and its arms and its eyes, very dynamic animal. It looks a lot like the shallow living species. Um, and what you'll see in a second is another squid come in. They'll do a bit of color changing and attack each other and go away. But the point is there are squids down in the deep um, that have the ability to change color. And it's, it's kind of, it's been sort of a mystery as to why they do this. There's obviously some reasoning would be like, well, you know, maybe they need to hide, do some counter shading. They can camouflage, even though this is not a complex habitat, like a coral reef, you know, there's still sunlight up at the surface and it's dark down deep. And so perhaps to hide from predators, you might, you might consider counter shading yourself. So you color yourself dark on top and light underneath sort of to, to match your surroundings. But if you look at, if you watch these, so this is the same species, perhaps in a more dense group. So these animals, um, something that's important to point out, oftentimes there are species that are, that are social. So they live in groups. Um, so Chrissy showed a video earlier of two small cuttlefish kind of going with a bigger cuttlefish. So there's some, there's some social behavior right there for you. So here's some Humboldt squid social behavior happening right behind me. This is happening down in the deep ocean, hundreds of meters below the ocean surface. So hundreds and hundreds of feet. This is a dark habitat. And if you pay close attention at these, at these squid, they're not just countershading themselves. You'll actually see them darken their fins. You'll see them color their entire body half light and half dark down the long axis. If you're particularly perceptive, you'll see little dots on their head appear. You'll see all sorts of little things happening. Now, here is where being able to communicate probably comes in handy. And it's pretty likely that they're using their pigmentation patterning to do so, to talk to each other and maybe you know, communicate information about what they're about to do whether they're going to go catch prey or if there's an incoming predator, things like that, really basic information. But the problem is, this is a dark habitat. And so it's been somewhat of a mystery. This, so I'm showing Humboldt squid right now, but there are plenty of other squids that, that do more complex color changing behaviors than you might expect, such as the eight arm squid or the, the octopus, um, octopotuthus delatron. I can't remember what the common name is. But if actually it'd be really cool if you could roll we it. Yeah, we call it the octopus squid here. The octopus squid. I get it. I get it. I get some of those common names confused. But there, the point is that there are several different deep sea species that have been described so far that are capable of, of doing all sorts of these uh, pigmentation patterns. So they'll have repertoires of pigmentation patterns. So here's some cool octopus squid footage. Ooh. Uh, they'll have there, it's, a it's back now. <laughs> Awesome. They'll have repertoires of pigmentation patterns that are, you know, you could think of them as kind of their, you know, uh, the things they're able to express. And, you know, some deep water species can express, you know, a, a, a repertoire very similar or, you know, in comparable uh, 
complexity to some shallow water species. And it's sort of, you know, it's been conjectured that that has to do with, you know, communication. And it's sort of been a mystery as to why, how these patterns are perceived in the, in the deeper, darker depths of the open ocean. And, you know, if you see videos of these animals, like, like you're seeing right now, probably is you'll see they'll have pretty big eyes. So they're, they're probably good at seeing under low light conditions, but a lot of their patterns are quite subtle. Um, and so perhaps they're doing something a little bit extra to, to enhance the visibility of these patterns. And so we have some research that came out recently where we think we've, we've come up with, or we've, we've identified their solution to this problem. And I'll just quickly give an analogy for shallow living species communication with chromatophores and what we think deep living species do. And the analogy would be, pretend you are trying to read a novel. You could read the novel in paperback form with a book. Um, and if you're gonna do that, you have to have light. You have to be able to shine light on the words of the page as the words on the page of the book. And so you could think of shallow living cephalopods, their pigmentation patterns being much like these words on the page of a book. Um, you need light in order to see them. But the deeper living species, at least some of them we think have a trick up their sleeve. And I will go ahead and say the punchline now. The punchline <laughs> is we think the deeper living species are a bit more like e-readers. So if you're reading that same novel, on an e-reader, you can go ahead and take that e-reader into the dark, turn out the lights, and you'll still be able to read it because the words on the e-reader screen are backlit. So, you know, your e-reader has, has a lighting that backlights the words. And so for these deeper living squids, like the Humboldt squid here, underneath their skin, which is where their pigmentation patterning all takes place, all the chromatophores are in the skin, underneath that, in the squid's body, are bioluminescent organs. And bioluminescence is a process by which animals, you know, produce light on their own. And so these organs, you could think of as little lights that cause the squid to glow. It causes the squid's body tissue to glow. So they have these little, little bioluminescent organs all throughout their bodies. And what they're able to do is make themselves glow. And then they change pigmentation patterning on top of that. And so you can think of the squid in the deep ocean more like e-readers and the squid in shallower ocean more like books, you know? And so, so that's a little bit about the communication. Um, one thing I was, I, I wanted to bring up something because I have Humboldt's good behind me right now. Um, something I wanted to bring up while we were talking about their lifespans that I think is a, a really cool thing that cephalopods can do that we just absolutely cannot is they have incredible flexibility in their life history. So life history is how organisms allocate energy and resources throughout different stages of their life. And it includes how long they live, how big they get, things like that. So our life history is very fixed. Okay, so, you know, I was born, um, I hit maturity at a certain age and I'll, you know, barring unforeseen things, I'll probably die at a certain age or in a certain range. And those things are all fairly, there is some wiggle room there, but those things are all fairly fixed. Now for cephalopods, especially the Humboldt squid and squids, that is absolutely not the case. Their life histories are not fixed. They're very flexible. So the squid behind me um, and the squid that are being shown right now, these Humboldt squid, um, you're seeing big versions of them. So these are squid that as they were growing up, they encountered habitats that were cool and full of food. And for a cephalopod, what that allows them to do is to continue to grow. So these squid that, we're, that you're seeing right now are probably close to two meters long in total length, maybe a little bit less. So they're about as big as me, you know, a big human. Um, so that's one, so, so Humboldt squid, they can live like they've clocked them to the maximum age around two years old. So these squid, you know, they, they're born at about the size of a grain of rice. That's when they hatch out of eggs and then they grow to two meters long in about two years, maybe not that long. And that's like, if conditions are good, they will get big and, and live long. That's long for a Humboldt squid, by the way, two years, that's very long. But alternatively, if the Humboldt squid encounters poor conditions when it grows up, 
warm, not enough food, what they will actually do is they will, instead of trying to reach that huge size, they'll just go ahead and mature at a tiny size and a very young age. So maybe around, maybe instead of growing to that two year lifespan and two meters long, they'll go ahead and mature at around five months of age and maybe just, you know, 20 centimeters or 18 centimeters. Now, can you imagine, just stop and think about that. Can you imagine if humans did that? That would mean if you were walking around on the streets in a city day to day, you would see fully mature humans with babies that were about a foot tall. And then you'd see fully mature humans with babies that were, you know, 10 feet tall. It's absolutely mind boggling. And this is a really interesting adaptation they have and it, it, it fits their strategy of life. So these are animals that, that, um, that they respond very quickly to change, be it good or bad. They're, if you think of if you think of squid or some other cephalopods as well, in terms of you know plants you might find in a forest, they're very much the grass. Whereas things like us and fish and you know all the charismatic vertebrates you might think of, those are more like the trees and shrubs. They take a long time to reach maturity, but once they're established, they do quite well. Squid do not. They're like the grass. So if a wildfire rips through and destroys all the vegetation, the first things to come back will probably be squid with their short life histories. They'll also be very quick to disappear. So they have these, you know, very responsive populations. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's just what's something that the flexibility in life history is something I wanted to bring up that I yeah. didn't quite get a chance to. No, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Ben. And then um, uh, I'll just add on. And if you want to um, correct me, uh, there, but uh, that maturing is happening at a younger age in a lot of Humboldt squid down off of Southern California and uh, Baja, Mexico, um, due to what's known as the oxygen minimum zone being an area of the ocean that's kind of rising up with climate change and making the habitat for foraging um, not quite as prime as it had been for, for a long time. Is that correct? So the Humboldt squid currently are maturing younger due to some climate change uh, effects there of, of where they forage. Is that, is that, do so I have I, that right? I'm happy. Yeah. I, so uh, I'll, I'll clarify just a little bit there. I, I don't want to shoot you down because you're, no, please you're do. Some, That's what this stream is very, for. You're hitting some very key topics. So actually the OMZ expansion was originally, so the oxygen minimum layer, that the expansion was actually associated with those animals doing quite well, especially oh, here. Okay because Humboldt squid actually, they have some physiological adaptations and behavioral adaptations that allow them to do very well in low oxygen layers in the ocean. So while other animals are suffocating and can barely stay alive, they're actively hunting and eating. Um, so they're actually efficient predators in the OMZ, whereas you know the prey animals are very lethargic. The Humboldt squid could dive down into these layers and, and just, just buffet status. What seems to be causing their decline in size at maturity, in addition to having these low oxygen layers, is the addition of warmer temperatures, gotcha. especially warming at depth. So when you get those two together, that seems to be a problem for them, because what they like to do is go down into these low oxygen layers and then come up to the surface and burn off their metabolic debt. So what, what you can imagine them going down in the deep ocean where there's low oxygen, it's, it's like sprinting, you know, they can do it for a while, they're, they're pretty good, but at some point you need to stop sprinting, otherwise you're basically going to, you know, acidify yourself to death because mm. all that lactic acid is going to build up. So what they need to do is come back up to shallower waters to burn off that metabolic debt, to breathe a lot of oxygen and get rid of it and then prep for the next, the next sprinting session, if you will. Even though when they're swimming in these low oxygen layers, it does not look like sprinting, they're, they're very relaxed. Mm. or they look very relaxed. Um, so the problem when it warms up though, is that just makes it way more costly for them. So squid and other cephalopods are what we call ectotherms. They're cold blooded. And so they essentially take on the temperature of the surrounding environment and their metabolism. So our metabolism is regulated by our body temperature. You know, we, we maintain our body temperature that keeps our metabolism fairly consistent. This is, we're oversimplifying here, but the squid, their metabolism kind of changes with the conditions they're in. And so if the temperatures become warmer, effectively what this does is it makes the squid burn through their energy. You know, they, they have to eat more in order to live in a warmer environment and grow. 
And so what happens when we see warming, like we have recently, the Humboldt squid, you know, they're, they're trying to make ends meet. They're trying to eat food, eat enough food to sustain their metabolism. And they just can't make ends meet when it gets warmer because usually what happens when it gets warmer, the same time there is also less food because off the coast of California here and off the coast of some parts of Mexico is what we call an upwelling ecosystem. And the reason that that ecosystem gets cold and gets lots of food is, is due to a longshore winds. And when those winds relax due to large scale climate variation, we get um, warming of water and less nutrients being upwelled. And so all the, all the smaller things that the squid eat disappear and the water gets warmer. So you can see how that can be kind of a double-edged sword for metabolism. So these animals will then, instead of just going extinct, they'll just go ahead and mature at very small sizes and young ages, kind of weather out the storm, if you will. Um, gotcha. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. No, thank you so much for the, for the correction. Um, I'm looking at the time. Incredibly, we are already coming up on 13 minutes left here for this uh, for the Cephalo party here. I guess we're currently doing a Cephalo podcast, as it were. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Chrissy an opportunity to respond to uh, to Ben from the shallow water perspective. I'm going to try to uh, create some fake tension between shallow and deep water cephalopod research at the moment and see um, who uh, who come who comes out uh, victorious? No, but Chrissy, did you have anything you you wanted to to add on to um, everything that Ben was mentioning about about what's going on in the in the deep? Uh, yeah. Um, I think yeah, it is fake tension because Ben and I oh quite, come on quite well, but um, <laughs> cephalopod I, I, I researchers respect each other. <laughs> okay, so um, there's some jealousy. All right, we'll we'll take we'll take that we we'll take that yeah. storyline to the yeah. end. That'll be in the edit to make sure that we yeah. had the okay. Yeah, and but I no. love salmon. So, um, but <laughs> but uh, I think something that people don't necessarily quite capture, but I think is important to note is that we think of midwater cephalopods as being completely exposed from all directions to predators. I mean, a predator can come from below, above, from the sides. They have to look out constantly. And that actually is the case in sh for shallow water cephalopods as well. And so what I'm going to show here, you know, we think of uh, uh, cephalopods dealing with fish predators. You know, there's a barracuda behind me. I'll duck a little bit so that it's a little easier to see the barracuda swimming behind me. There's something that always wants to eat from above, but for many cephalopods, there's also something below that also wants to eat you. This is a mantis shrimp, a stomatopod. It, you can see its eyes sort of at the top. Um, not those purple things, those are cleaner shrimp. Um, but that mantis shrimp is waiting in the sediment, in the mud to lunge up and eat an octopus. This is a flounder that is also well camouflaged, waiting in the sediment to come up from above. This is a stargazer that's you know looking to lunge up and catch cephalopod cephalopod prey and Star so there really are predators everywhere just to interrupt stargazers look like uh, somebody who's been staring at the internet a little bit too long during the day i recognize a few social media managers <laughs> expressions but yes yeah stargazers uh, yeah. are a famous uh yeah sorry to interrupt but yeah just had to no, throw it out there i always love that we have a stargazer at the aquarium. We do right now. Really? Yeah, that's yeah, great. It's in our tube anemone exhibit. It's the one fish besides our angel shark. I feel like nobody knows exists inside the aquarium. So for folks who are going to visit, stop by the the tube anemone exhibit, and uh, if you're lucky, you might be able to to spot it in there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Anyway, sorry, Chrissy. Uh, back to you. Yeah. Um, something else that shallow and deep water cephalopods have in common is Ben showed that video of the Humboldt squids flashing on one side of the body but not the other. This is a larger Pacific striped octopus. Uh, they live in Panama, in certain parts of Mexico, and you can see the animal in the foreground is flashing these different body patterns in the beginning of the video. It did it um, on one side of its body, but not the other. If you notice behind my head, there is 
that's actually a female octopus and then aquarium behind it that it can see. So it's signaling to the female on on her side. But if they're in theory, you know, if this animal were in the wild, it might not want to show that signal everywhere. So it's only signaling it on half of the the half of the body that needs to see that signal, and then the other half it's kind of keeping quiet. It's it's, it's hmm. you know laying low so maybe the predators don't see it. That's fascinating. Um, I feel like most people. <laughs> I feel like most people do that internally and, and externally instead of having one side being chill and the other side that I think that'd be a really good adaptation if we could port that over to people where you could just turn your stressed out or happy side to whoever needs to hear it. I feel like that'd be very effective uh, nonverbal communication there. Sorry, Ben, you had something to say. Oh, I'll, I was, I'll, I'll jump in also with some more similarities. I think we have some videos too that that would be cool to show. Um, yeah, so a lot of, you know, speaking of like hiding from predators from from all sides, you know, shallow and deep, something you can do, aside from just camouflaging yourself to the ambient background, you can actually go ahead and pretend to be something else entirely, you can do, you know, you might pretend to be something that say has that it has stinging cells as a as an animal that that might be an undesirable thing to eat that might be slightly dangerous, you know, offer a sting or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, something we see in shallow and deeper living cephalopods uh, is, is mimicry. And uh, so in the deeper ones, you know, they'll, we've seen them pretend to be jellyfish and other things like jellyfish. These are animals. So the jellyfish, these are animals that are not as good of a prey item as a squid would be, you know, they have much lower energy density and they're, they have, they have stinging defenses and things like that. Um, so sometimes we see that that, uh, that out in the open ocean, yeah. mimicry that happens, the cephalopods will pretend to be jellyfish. Uh, Chrissy, what, what happens in shallow water? What, what do you think is pretend to be in shallower waters? Um, they, the mimic octopus is known for mimicking things like flatfish, but across the board, it's very common for uh, octopuses and cuttlefishes to just look like something that's not a meal. And so um, this is a walking octopus. It's moving bipedally and it looks a lot like a clump of algae where this octopus lives. This is an octopus that lives in Australia, Indonesia, the Philippines. And um, one of the big things um, that octopuses do is they look like algae, these cuttlefish, um, can kind of match to the coral behind them um, and just try to look like anything other than a meal. But the mimic octopus, let's see, we have actually, I think somewhere we have a picture of a mimic octopus, mimic profile, Patrick, I think it's called. Yes. Yeah. Let me just pull that one up. And uh, just for the just for the folks back at home, uh, I showed the video footage there of the Humboldt squid flashing and then a little bit of a snippet of that mimicry um, that you were mentioning between the swordtail squid and the siphonophores. We, we've mentioned that on a few of our live streams before, but here, let me pull up that, uh, that mimic octopus. Mimic profile, you said? Yeah. All right. Let's see that. Let me just put it in a good spot. All right, it's up on screen, Chrissy. Okay, great. So the mimic octopus that lives in Indonesia, the Philippines, um, you know, Southeast Asia, lives on sandy habitats, and it doesn't really have that much to hide in. Even though it has great camouflage against sand, it has also evolved a way to kind of be visible all the time. And it swims like a flatfish and it evolved, it seems like it evolved this ability at about the same time that it and its relatives, its ancestors evolved very long arms. And so this allows it to have the shape of a flounder and other flatfish when it swims, but it also provides that biomechanic advantage of kind of having a low profile and a slim way of cutting through the water as it moves slowly across the bottom. Mimic octopuses are also thought to mimic sea snakes with two of their arms and other animals. As with a lot of things related to cephalopods, mimicry is in the eye of the beholder. Um, whether I think something looks like a sea snake or something that's not tasty doesn't really matter. It's what 
matters to the predators. And so how effective these behaviors are as an actual defense against predation is not well studied. Gotcha. Oh, that's fascinating. And I know the uh, the mimic octopus had its moment of virality, as a few different <laughs> animals do uh, out there. Shout out to Matt Inman at the oatmeal. Uh, or no, I think it was an XKCD. Um, uh, yeah, uh, lots of different uh, mimic octopus um, content out there. I'm looking at the time. We've got just about three minutes left here on the official hour. We might go a little bit long, but uh, this is usually the time that Emily takes a, a group of questions from everything that was going on out there and gives you a little bit of a rapid fire uh, Q&A here. So um, we'll just uh, have short answers to these quick questions from the folks out there um, just to make sure that we, we tie up some loose ends. So Emily, rapid fire questions for Christy and Ben. All right, I've got quite a few questions. I will, we'll try and make them rapid fire. Uh, but well, well, let's start with some truly rapid fire questions. Chrissy, Ben, what are your personal favorite cephalopods? And I'm so glad you asked this because I do have the video <laughs> queued up right behind me. <laughs> this is the robust club hook squid, Onychia robusta, and it's the second largest uh, squid species in the North Pacific. I think it, it scoots by the limelight a lot because it's not the biggest but they are absolutely fascinating and we should learn more about them. You can see this animal right here is probably only a couple meters long, but they get much bigger um, and they're, they're very cool. So I'll can you, that playing. can you repeat the name for everybody? The robust club hook squid, or you could look up club hook squid. They're often will be beached in Oregon, Washington, Alaska. People will find them on the beach. Um, that's because when they die, they use so they seem to use ammonia to regulate their buoyancy and when they die um, it builds up and they'll actually float to the surface and wash to shore whereas a lot of squids when they die will just sink to the bottom of the ocean we never see them so so gotcha. yeah and the scientific name is onychia robusta and one of my colleagues in alaska she's done some work on their stable isotopes looks sort of at their diet and they seem to feed it very high up in the food chain like very close to what sperm whales are doing even Oh, so wow. These, these things uh, eat, they eat big things, probably like, like a uh, big fish. Cool. Right really on. Cool. All right, Chrissy. So my favorite cephalopod is Abdipus aculeatus, the algae octopus. And this is an octopus that I've studied in Indonesia and Australia. And it um, kind of breaks the rules. It's somewhat social and they interact with each other a lot. They live in these small groups in the wilds. They're one of the bipedally walking octopuses and they have a lot of communication with each other and they're just really a fascinating animal. And they also are very, live very shallow. So they're an animal that you can see on snorkel. You don't have to scuba dive if you're ever in the areas where they live, but these and many other areas, um, many other octopuses throughout the world, including along our California coast, live in shallow water, um, sometimes can be found in tide pools or while snorkeling. And so keep an eye out um, across the world on your respective coastlines and in your respective waters for octopuses. Right on. Thank you awesome. so much. All right. Next rapid fire question. What is the smallest cephalopod in the world? And conversely, what's the largest cephalopod? I'll, I'll let you decide who, who wants to fight for which, which one there. Ben, I'll take the smallest if you take the largest. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So the smallest described cephalopod to my knowledge is octopus wolfi, which is a tiny little octopus that is like thumb-sized at most, um, but some of them are mature at less than a centimeter long. Um, and there's an undescribed octopus from Australia that's smaller than that, um, but we have not gotten around to um, describing that. There are also very small squids. Um, Idiosepius is the genus. They're you know, in this one to two centimeter range fully mature and i believe the aquarium has had them but i don't know if you do right now all right so that's the the, yeah. the, the tiny ones mm -hmm. the ben? big ones 
Yeah, on the other side of the spectrum, things that I don't think the aquarium, maybe someday in the future, you'll be able to have these. But <laughs> so by length, it would be Architeuthis, Architeuthis do. There's several subspecies. Um, so those by length are the largest. That is the giant squid that we've all heard of. Um, and those things get very long. Um, by volume, though, the largest squid is the colossal squid. Um, so it's not as long as Architeuthis. Um, but it is by volume a lot bigger. Uh, so they're, they're a very massive, very massive animal. And those, those things are in the Southern Ocean. Um, so around, you know, but yeah, the, the Southern Ocean around Antarctica and, and slightly more, more toward the equator. Um, yeah, those are the two largest, colossal and giant. Ooh. Right on. We have yet to All discover right. the gargantuan squid. Well, I would propose actually calling the Robust Club a squid, the gargantuan squid. You just need a catchy name to get it more attention. All right. So, there we go. We're, okay, you heard it here first. Everybody who's watching uh, around the internet, out with club hook, in with gargantuan squid. You heard it here first. Uh, just like a group of mola is being called a guac of mola. Let's get this going. Let's make it part of the parlance. Gargantuan squid. Boom. We got you covered, Ben. Can I, can I throw in another one that I would like to pitch right now? Oh, actually, yes, please. Some colleagues yes. and I have really, we're actually, we're seriously trying to get this out, is uh, what, what you call a, a group of squid, okay? A group yeah. of squid. This is something that I get a lot, and here I'm going to show a group of squid right behind me. Okay, we want to call it a squad, right? Yes, squad. the squid yeah. squad. The squid squad. I've seen yeah. it on the internet before in, in various chat forums, but uh, let's, let's get the word out there. Let's, yeah. make, let's make it official. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Yes. If the cockeyed squid can become the strawberry squid and a group of molas can be a guac, then we can get the squid squad out there, everybody. So um, join the squid squad with everybody. Yes. Uh, Emily, <laughs> it's 12.03. Yes. Are there any super pressing questions there... that we would be remiss to uh, not have on the stream? So I've I've got three like more important questions and then a very quick very important question uh do we have time for for all of those pat yes let's do that okay okay so we'll start with the serious ones here first um so chrissy ben we've been talking about shallow octopuses and cephalopods uh, versus deep sea cephalopods here and kind of been using those two terms but folks are curious how do we determine what is a shallow water cephalopod versus a deep sea cephalopod especially when you live in a three-dimensional environment where you might have some of those same species going back and forth between those two habitats ben and i just arm wrestle to decide <laughs> yes um, <laughs> yeah i would not want to take on chrissy she's a surfer she's strong so but with your study species you have plenty of arms as backup so like that's yeah. part of it yeah no. yeah i uh, I always, ben, so I've used in papers a threshold of like, if it's maximum recorded depth is below 200 meters, but I think there are other ways to define it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Ben's mention earlier of cephalopods that go up and down in the water column really shows that that boundary is fairly artificial for some species. Some squids go to the surface at night and then might be down to 600 meters during the day. Love it. All right. All right. Uh, another really great question that has been brought up um, uh, across our platforms, and I love that all of our followers are thinking about this right now. We talked a little bit about climate change and its effects on squid. Uh, folks are curious, are there any species that are more vulnerable to climate change things that are happening in the ocean right now and what are ways that we can help protect those animals in the ocean i think yeah any cephalopod that relies on hiding in a habitat um I, i'm showing behind me an area of um it's a marine habitat that's basically been leveled. It, it doesn't have its three-dimensional structure anymore. And so, um, you know, sometimes the decisions that led to the habitat behind me being destroyed were made tens and decades ago. The people who live in this area are not the people who did this. And so I think sometimes 
supporting activities that leave the seafloor intact will help protect a lot of animals. So understanding where your fish come from, understanding the activities that impact the seafloor, um, those will help protect the cephalopods that interact with the seafloor. Um, ben, I'll, I'll hand it to you to talk about things that would protect the midwater cephalopods. Sure, I would say big picture evidence seems somewhat mixed about ocean acidification. So we'll just let that stand at that. Um, but big picture, I would actually say people should be on the lookout for open ocean squids um, to be showing up in places where they historically haven't been detected. Um, I think one thing that a lot of open ocean squids can do is they're, they're very modal, they're very good at swimming. And, you know, if, if their body size is big enough, they can actually travel significant distances. And so in something that people should be doing is, is paying attention to what's showing up in their, in their local in their local waters if they happen to live near the ocean or talking to people that do. Because when squid invade a new ecosystem or come in a new ecosystem, you know, they're predators. So they can exert some effects on the, on the communities that typically don't have them. So that's just something to keep, to keep in mind is that, you know, I think as, as waters warm and things get more variable, species that typically aren't found in places start showing up and they do things. Um, a good example is like the Humboldt squid off the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska about, you know, five or so years ago. So, so things like that, I think it's good to pay attention to. Um, aside from that, I'm not sure we know quite enough to, to say this is what you should do for squid out in the open ocean, uh, aside from stopping burning fossil fuels and this, that, that whole lot of, of things. Gotcha. Yeah, fundamentally changing our economic system is uh, certainly at the end of the, the spectrum of, of those things there. But uh, a, a thread to unravel um, for for all of the folks that are back there at home. I uh, just want to give an opportunity uh, super quick here for those of you folks out there who have been enjoying this live stream. Thank you to everybody who's been tuning in on Twitch, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, all around uh, the the Internet. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I did want to let everybody know that this is Cephalopod Week, but not the end of live streams. We've got another one coming up on Monday on the aquarium side, but I wanted to make sure that Susan right below here, had a moment to plug a really, really awesome live stream that's going to be happening with the Embari crew uh, coming up here at the end of this month. So Susan, the floor is yours here. Tell us about the live stream coming up here June 30th. Thanks so much, Patrick. Yeah, we are having an event on June 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific. We're going to dive into the it's called live from the deep and we'll be going to sir ridge live so you can actually come with us on the cruise virtually and this is the first time that we're doing an event like this we'll have scientists aquarists from the aquarium as well as researchers from the monterey bay national marine sanctuary and you'll get to answer, oh, and one of our ROV pilots, and you'll get to ask questions to our experts. And we'll be exploring the sponge and coral gardens at Sir Ridge. So we're really excited and we hope you join us. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Susan. If you head over to our YouTube channel, the either the Aquariums and Baris, or if you're on our Twitch right now, you can see it in the VODs. We've done some live streams previously under the tagline Mysteries of the Deep about Sir Ridge, about that really cool area. Um, so lots of really fun stuff coming out of that zone. Uh, and live streams coming up at the at the end of the month. So I just hope everybody here has made themselves a reminder. Make sure to give us a follow on the Aquarium social channels and on Embari's social channels so that you are alerted as to when that live stream is if you want some more fun stuff. Um, with that, I just want to shout out all of the amazing moderators that are down here on the lower part of the screen. we got George, Susan, and Cassie who've been knocking it out of the park there uh, in the comments as well. Emily over there has been monitoring chats all across uh, the world. Thank you so much for grabbing all those questions for us there, Emily. And uh, I want to give, oh, Emily, do you have something to say? Oh, no. Uh, oh. Do we have 
time for another question or are we I wrapping think, it up, Pat? I think we'll do one last question okay. and the, then we will conclude here for uh, for the stream. My belly is rumbling here. It's just about lunchtime. <laughs> so I've just been hearing about um, all of the physiological needs of these animals. And I definitely have a determinate growth um, and need to... <laughs> <laughs> um, feed that feed that system. So, um, but Emily, what is going on? Uh, what final question? Kick us off. All right. We'll we'll stick with the 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 serious one <laughs> here instead of the silly one to, to end it because it's really important. Um, because we have some people who have been lifelong fans of cephalopods who are watching right now. We also have some brand new fans of cephalopods who are watching right now, including some folks who are in school. They might be in college right now, in high school right now, and they are thinking about pursuing a career in the marine sciences. So we like to ask this of everyone. Oh, how did you get to do all this cool stuff? And do you have any advice for someone who's looking to get into cephalopod science? And in particular, we had one person ask, is there anything that you would recommend someone study or volunteer or work at if they don't live close to an ocean, but they still want to be a cephalopod scientist? So well, Chrissy, you start, please. Okay, I'll jump in um, and I'll put this video behind me because I feel like it answers a lot of that question from my perspective is I was motivated to go into marine science and I love invertebrates. I have since I was a child. And so I went to college for marine science and had the opportunity to do an internship um, I worked many sunny summers, but um, one semester I did an internship and uh, was provided the opportunity to study octopuses and I just kept taking opportunities as they came and um, wasn't well funded, but um, my priorities were to be in the water rather than to um, I wasn't picky about where I lived and often was couch surfing and that was my own particular story, but there are many different paths toward marine science and cephalopod biology and um, I show the video behind me of the walking octopus um, might have to restart it here um, because you don't have to be a diver to study cephalopods you don't have to live near the water, you can be um, a computer scientist, you can be somebody who studies physics, you can study robotics, you can study cephalopods from lots of different angles. And the bipedal octopus behind me inspired the production of soft um, robots that move bipedally underwater. Um, computationally, it's really difficult to try to figure out how octopuses and other cephalopods control their bodies within the constraints of the central nervous system and the distributed nervous system that they have. So that's a computer science question. So lots of computer scientists are studying cephalopods as well. And so basically, if you have a topic that you are really good at and you love dive, throwing yourself into and want to know how it's connected to cephalopod biology and might be able to contribute to cephalopod research, send me an email. <laughs> you know, I'm easy to find on the internet. And I love helping people explore different ways to join forces with marine science. Absolutely. I'll, I'll second that. It's a, it's, it tends to be a case by case basis, but the, yeah, the main thing, if you're interested, you know, reach out to someone who, who studies cephalopods. And I think each of them could give you helpful advice. I know Chrissy certainly gave me helpful advice when I was searching for PhD programs and things like that. You may not remember that Chrissy, but I still have, I still have the notebook from the notes from that meeting. Uh, so <laughs> just, just, yeah, that, that is a, that is one way that it can be done and it works, worked out. So, yeah. We like to help each other out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And oh man, I love that. I love your ideas of like, oh, there's all these different areas where cephalopods can, can provide inspiration, um, you know, different areas of research and uh, yeah. So it's a good, good point. Awesome. So uh, yeah, to everybody out there watching, we have not, um, crack into the code of cephalopods of everything going on out there with them still plenty to learn still plenty to find out lots of places to 
explore uh, not only what cephalopods are doing out there in, in the ocean for the ecology, for the world around them, but also how they're getting it done internally. Um, so many different avenues there. I wanted to say thank you once again to everybody here for being on the panel. Thank you to all of the audience out there for tuning in. There is more Cephalopod Week content. Take a look at that hashtag for hashtag cephalopod week um, lots of stuff happening you can head over to monterebayaquarium.org and we have uh, a cephalopod week schedule over there and Ambari also has uh, plenty plenty of um, cephalopod content out there all across the internet that you can go and find and look for and once again last plug june 30th is that uh sir ridge live stream very, very excited for that. Again, follow uh, Mbari's social channels and the Aquarium social channels so that you know uh, when that is. All right. Uh, well, with that, everybody, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this special Cephalopod Week live stream uh, where I tried and failed to have uh, shallow water cephalopods battle out deep sea cephalopods for, for likes. It seems everybody is working together just like the arms and suckers of um, our subjects today. So thanks so much, everybody, and we will see you again soon at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's social media feeds. Happy Cephalopod Week, everybody. We'll see y'all again soon.